by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible, that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or capital of Israel, of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this, and then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Today, once again, in collaboration with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress, from the Ministry Inquisition Update from the United States of America. And Tom and I are gathered here together for the 63rd reading, 63rd study of the book Exploding the Israel Deception which started with End Time Delusions by Steve Wahlberg and now we go into section 4 of that book which was published first as an own little book called Exploding the Israel Deception. We are still there in chapter 3. Um, the Shocking Principles of Two Israels, if I'm not mistaken, is the name called. <laughs> Let me just see this here. Yeah, Explode. Um, uh, which is it? The Shocking Principle of Two Israels. Yeah, that's correct. That's the name of the chapter. And I warmly welcome Tom to the broadcast today. Hello, brother. How are you doing? Hello. Hello, Yerk. It's a wonderful thing to be here and uh, get to have these discussions. And uh, I give thanks to the Lord for the listeners and uh, an opportunity to uh, increase their level of understanding in uh, what the Bible speaks of when it speaks of Israel. There are two Israels in the world, an Israel of unbelief, and that Israel is the one situated on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. The nation state of Israel is a state of unbelief. They, not, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Those who are of the faith of Abraham are counted for the seed. The seed of Abraham come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they believe God just like Abraham did. And it is accounted unto them for righteousness. And what do we believe that makes us Israel? that Jesus is the Son of God, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, that when we are washed in his blood, 
we are redeemed from our sins, reconciled to God, brought everlasting righteousness into the world. That's an everlasting kingdom under Christ. That is the Israel of God. So don't be confused with the Israel of God and the Israel of the world, the Israel of belief compared to the Israel of unbelief. There are two Israels in the world, just like there are two Christianities in the world. There are true Bible-believing Christians who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, are of the faith of Abraham. They believe God, and it's accounted unto them for righteousness. We believe that Jesus' sacrifice takes away our sins and reconciles us to God. Then there is an other Christianity that is a false Christianity that says you must earn your salvation by keeping the sacraments and by making sacrifice and by doing good works. That is not Christianity. They can call it Christianity till the cows come home, but it doesn't make it so. The vast majority of those who call themselves Christians in this world are not Christians any more than the Pharisees and the Sadducees were Jews or sons of Abraham. And uh, this is the difference that we must comprehend when the subject of Israel comes up. The first question we must ask ourselves is, what Israel? The Israel of unbelief? For the Israel of faith. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, Tom, the Israel of unbelief is a very important and interesting point that you mentioned that. And um, I just want to, I, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I just want to mention that the Israel that is there settled in the Mediterranean or on the Mediterranean shores, uh, the country that we know of today, uh, which is the Israel of unbelief nowadays, is the host of the world's largest quote-unquote gay parade, love parade, sodomizing uh, people going out on the streets and celebrating their quote-unquote freedom and their quote-unquote choice to be whatever they want to be in the world. Did you know that? The one yeah, that goes so, through Jerusalem is the biggest one in the world. Even not the Christopher Street Day in New York is, is, is smaller than that one. Now, can that be the Israel of God? No, the Israel on the eastern end of the Mediterranean uh, looks just like uh, the United States of America. Or worse. Or worse. It's a nation of unbelief. And... Uh, by, your, by their fruits, you shall know them. Yeah. I think many people don't even know that these parades are the biggest in the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. They should look that up. You can easily find that on your internet search engine. But I just wanted to make a short point out of it, you know, uh, not starting a big discussion about it. Look it up for yourselves. We are going to read Exploding the Israel Deception in the chapter I told you. We stopped on page 30. I should continue with Paul, but before reading Paul, I go back one paragraph where it says, The big question is, what about the promises God made to Israel in the Old Testament? If we conclude that those promises must be fulfilled to the Israel of the flesh, then we must conclude that Jerusalem and the modern Jewish nation will eventually become the center of the final battle of Armageddon. But if we conclude that those promises can legitimately be fulfilled to God's Israel in the spirit, then we must restudy the book of Revelation to discover how its end-time prophecies apply to Christians. Now, Paul deals with this highly explosive issue in Romans chapter 9 verses 2 through 8, and we are going to read them right here. Quote, That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God, and the promises, 
whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but an Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. His words require careful thought. With continual sorrow in his heart, Paul wrote about his Jewish um, kinsmen, and we are going to continue this in uh, verses 2 through 4 in the, uh, in the same chapter, Romans 9, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. God did make promises to Israel in the Old Testament, yet, what if some Jews do not believe in him? Can God fulfill his promises to an unbelieving Israel in the flesh? If not, has his word failed? Interesting questions, and I think we answered them already during the last session, and we will probably answer them again in this and other coming sessions. Can God fulfill his promises to an unbelieving Israel in the flesh? Can God fulfill his promises to the nation-state of Israel at the Mediterranean Sea today? Is he willing to? And if he doesn't do it, has his word failed? Or have we just misinterpreted his word? Now Paul's answer to these important questions is clear. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, as we can read in verse 6. Notice that the concept of two Israels is Paul's assurance that God's word will not fail. Look carefully. Not as though the word, has, uh, the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, the Israel of God, which are of Israel, speaking of the Jewish nation. Thus, a Jew can be of the Jewish nation, and yet not be part of the Israel of God. Now here is the highly explosive question. To which Israel will God fulfill his promises? Paul continues then in Romans chapter 9, verse 7, quote, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but an Isaac shall thy seed be called. You know, and this was the reason why last time I did this um, explanation about Esau and Jacob. Yeah? Because Jacob and Esau are both the children of Isaac. So when in Isaac shall thy seed be called. It is also the seed of Isaac where the seed is being called. But we know that the true seed comes out of Jacob who became Israel and not out of Esau. So this is my chance to correct the mistake in the comment I made last time. Anyway, since not all physical descendants of Abraham are automatically God's children, therefore his promise are for those in Isaac. Abraham had two sons. The first was Ishmael, who was born after the flesh. I made that in my comment last week also. The second was Isaac, who was born when Abraham had faith in God's promise. And we read that in Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Quote, now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abraham, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, and it may be that I may obtain children by her. 
and Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And, Sarai's, and Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. In verse 15 we read, And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. And also in Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, where we read, quote, And the Lord visited Sarah, as he, said, as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived, and bare Abram a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Also notice the little fact that the name of Abraham's wife, Sarai, is changed to Sarah, and Abraham is changed to Abraham, as we pronounce him today, in the meantime. So there happened a lot of things in between, and this, I think, is also a fact that proves that they believed God, that Abraham, when he was made righteous, got a name change from Abraham to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. Uh, could you agree with that interpretation, Tom, with that understanding? Certainly. Yes, this often happens in the scripture when, uh, when faith comes to a man, God changes his name. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and the best example, of course, is a little later when we go into Jacob, and Jacob's name is changed into Israel. That's right. Yeah, I think that is the most uh, famous example in the Bible. Uh, the changes here are a little more subtle. It's only one letter. It's the H instead of an I, and it is an H that is added to the name. And many people often even read over this, because when of Abraham is being spoken in this world, we always speak of Abraham with an H, never of Abraham. Many people don't even recognize that. They say, oh, it's just another way of writing. No, it's not another way of writing. It is a changing of a name by God. God has a reason for every letter that he put in the Bible and the place he put it in. That's why it is so important that you have a correct Bible, by the way. I just want to mention that. <laughs> yes, we always have to mention that. It's, 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 it's absolutely essential that you read the correct Bible. And that's the authorized King James Bible. Uh, many, many critics, the whole world criticizes that Bible. And that's how we know it's God's Word, interestingly. Yeah. Let me say it, let me say it again. It is the most criticized of all the Bibles. And what would you expect in, in, a, in, a, in an unchristian world, but the criticism, almost universal criticism, of the authorized King James Bible? It's because it's the Word of God. Not only do they criticize the Bible, the 1611 King James Bible, they also criticize God and think he does not exist and teach evolution theory instead of the true um, um, creation of God that happened, you know. They deny God in every, in every sense, and that is also when they deny the true Bible. They deny God again. Uh, they do that on every level today in the world that we live in today. So when, not, not when, this world, when this world denies something or criticizes something, it is worth taking a second look. Yes. And, and not to belabor the point, because I know it's really not the subject that we're, that we're discussing here, but one more proof positive way to identify the authentic word of Almighty God, and that is that it interprets itself. You do not need a man to teach you. All the other Bibles, you must have someone to interpret it for you. Okay? That's why you need a priester or a pastor, right? But the authorized King James Version of the Bible interprets itself. You have no need that a man should teach you. It says so right in the Scripture. And that's the proof positive way to positively identify the authentic word of Almighty God. 
and let the criticisms begin. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I think it is always important that we make the point on the true 1611 King James Bible. Yeah, it can never be overstated. So, we continue to read in Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, or even a little longer, because I said, no, we're going to start reading in 16 and go to 25, where it says, quote, Therefore, this is Paul speaking, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred year old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Very powerful statement Paul gives here. In the book of Romans, the first book, the first church where Paul went to when he started churches outside of Judea, in Galatians chapter 4, verses 22 through 31, Paul reveals that Ishmael represents unbelieving Jews, while Isaac presents both Jews and Gentiles who have faith. And that is the point that I made a little bit unclear last time with my comment, but this is the point I wanted to say. Ishmael represents unbelieving Jews quote-unquote unbelieving Israel, I call it, but it's unbelieving Jews, while Isaac represents both Jews and Gentiles who have faith. Now, in Galatians 20, 22-31, we read, oh, that's a little, should be a little bit bigger here. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he who was of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry that thou travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And I'll just see that I forgot to use here the AV1611 and use the 1769 Blaney version. I have to correct that in the future. I looked over this, therefore my excuses. Now Paul reveals what I just read, that Ishmael represents unbelieving Jews. 
while Isaac represents both Jews and Gentiles who have faith. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise in Galatians chapter 4, verse 28. The children of the promise are those who, quote, receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Galatians chapter 3, verse 14, where it says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith faith, not through works, through faith. Therefore, in uh, the Israel that is in Isaac is the Israel of God in the Spirit. Paul concludes in Romans chapter 9 verse 8, quote, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Here is a summary of Paul's reasoning. 1. In the Old Testament, God made promises to the seed of Abraham. 2. This seed would continue in Isaac. 3. Isaac was born through faith. 4. Isaac represents those who have faith. 5. All who have faith Jews and Gentiles alike are counted for the seed. 6. This seed is the Israel of God. 7. God will fulfill his promises to this Israel. And 8. Therefore, the word of God to Israel has not been made of none effect, even though some natural Jews do not believe. So I wrote a little comment here that reads, the point being, and we will see that later on also in studying this book, a natural Jew who does not believe in Jesus Christ is no different from a Gentile who does not believe. Galatians 3 verse 28 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, unquote. Now, for ye are all one in Satan for them that do not believe. I know this sounds harsh, but the truth comes hard when you have been raised with a lie all your life. And I think that Tom has surely to add something to what I just read. No, I, I, I think you said it well. I, I, how can you uh, add to perfection? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah I, have the, I have these moments when led by the Spirit that I can write these wonderful things down, yeah. Good. Then let's just continue. Thus we have the answer to the issue that means so much in prophetic interpretation. The Bible is clear and never ever says anything untrue, by the way, yeah. The Bible is the word of God. God is incapable of lying. The Bible is true and the Bible is clear. You only have to read it, study it and read the correct Bible as we just said. Then you will also understand. God will fulfill his Old Testament promises to those in Isaac, that is, to his Israel in the spirit. And why does he choose the Israel in the spirit? Well, because the Bible says that God wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So when you are not in the spirit, how can you worship God? Or, let's say, how can you worship the right God? How can you worship Elohim? Those who are only the children of flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. As Romans 9, 8 said, emphasis, these are not the children of God. This emphasis is added by the author. We should not expect God to fulfill his promises to an unbelieving Israel in the flesh, unless, of course, those natural Israelites choose to believe in Jesus Christ, <laughs> which then again would make them spiritual Israel. We will examine one more atomic section before we close this chapter. What about Paul's question 
Hath God cast away his people? When we read Romans chapter 11 verse 1. This word is being quoted this verse sorry this verse is being quoted around the world to prove that God has not cast away the Israel of the flesh. Yet notice Paul's answer God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, or as the sixteen eleven King James Bible says, I say then hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Notice that Paul uses himself as an example to prove that God has not cast away his people. Well, Tom, I think it is appropriate that we make a little excursion here to tell the people where Paul actually comes from. Paul was first mentioned in the Bible as a person that, whose name was Saul. And that was in Acts chapter 8, when the, Steve, when the stoning of Stephen took place, and the people laid down their clothes at the feet of their leader, which was Saul. And Saul then later went on the road to Damascus because he wanted to have letters from the leading Jewish hierarchy there to allow him to continue with the persecution of true Jesus Christ followers. And all of a sudden he met Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ made him change from Saul to Paul. Again, Tom we see a name change, and with that we see a character change, and one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of the apostles, of the teachers of the New Testament, arose out of a, persecu a persecuting person uh, from the Jewish nation, from the tribe of Benjamin, as he says. Paul himself uses himself as an example to prove that God has not cast away his people, because God has chosen the fleshly soul to make him a spiritual Paul. Any yeah. thoughts on your kind there, Tom? On your, on your, from your side. The, the, the end of the 70th week of Daniel had come. The stoning of Stephen, the last testimony that the Sanhedrin heard about the covenant that Jesus was confirming to the Jews and to Jerusalem was given for the last time by the mouth of Stephen. And the Sanhedrin, rather than accepting Christ as their Messiah, stoned Stephen to shut him up. That signaled the end of the 70th week of Daniel. Okay? And how do we know it was the end of the 70th week of Daniel? Because the gospel then went to the Gentiles. That's how you know that the 70th week of Daniel is over. Many people, nobody contests that, uh, many people do not contest that the first three and a half years have been fulfilled. But there are many who say, well, how do we know the last three and a half years were fulfilled? How do we know that the last three and a half years of the 70th week of Daniel are still, 2,000 years later, still yet future? See, this is the great controversy, the great the, uh, the great deception in the Christian churches. Some say there is the, the, the entire 70th week of Daniel yet to be fulfilled, and some say that there's the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week yet to be fulfilled. So they don't even agree with one another, but they're both wrong because Jesus said not to go unto the way of the Gentiles because Daniel prophesied that the Messiah would come and, and confirm the covenant with the Jews and Jerusalem for seven years. In the midst of the week, the midst of that seven-year period of time, he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Why? Because he gave up his own life. He became the Lamb of God. All right? So we know that's the midst of the week. Well, what about the remaining three and a half years? That was fulfilled by the Spirit of Christ in the Spirit-filled apostles continuing to confirm the covenant in Christ's blood for the remaining three and one-half years. The end of that three and a half years came when, 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 when Stephen 
for the last time convinced the Sanhedrin, the governing body of, of, Jew, of the Jews in Jerusalem, that they had wickedly slew their own Messiah. He convinced them. But instead of getting on their face before the Lord and accepting his propitiation for their sins and receiving him as their king, they stoned Stephen to shut him up. From that day forward, Christ's prophecy was fulfilled. The 70th week of Daniel was over, and the gospel was now to be preached to the Gentiles. Is the gospel preached among the Gentiles, or is the gospel preached among the Jews? Anyone with any common sense knows the Jews don't preach the gospel. They are, a, they are in unbelief. The gospel is believed in the Gentile world. It is preached in the Gentile world to Gentiles and to Jews. That's how we know the 70th week of Daniel is over. Only question you have to ask is, who is responsible for the, for the gospel today? Is it the Jews or the Gentiles? Is the 70th week of Daniel over? Absolutely. The gospel is preached by the Gentiles. So. If that's the case, what, uh, who is Israel? Who is Israel? It's those among the Jews and the Gentiles that accept the propitiation of Christ's blood for their sins. That's the Israel of the Spirit. God doesn't care if they are Jews or Gentiles. Jesus is believed on in the world by Gentiles and Jews. They are the Israel of God. And don't let your priester or pastor tell you otherwise. And don't be so concerned about that Jewishness and that Israel on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. That is the Israel of unbelief. Those who are of the promise are counted for the seed. That's those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Jew, be he Jew or Gentile, free or bond, male or female, they are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the Israel of God. And the whole world of churches is designed to confuse you about who Israel is. What is Israel? Let me tell you, Satan's war is not against a bunch of unbelieving Jews located in Jerusalem on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Satan's war in this world is against the Israel of God. And the whole world is aligning itself to be against the Israel of God. We are the target of the great horrors that are about to befall this world, not the Israel on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. As convincing as they can make it look, we are the target of Satan's hatred. And we are the target of their assailing the gospel of the believing Jew, the believing Gentile. We are the target. And uh, that's when our Christ is going to deliver us. God's people, Jew and Gentile, have suffered for over 2,000 years. We've been the target of papal oppression, inquisition, crusade, and every other, every other blasphemy. And their hatred for the God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian is no less today than it ever was in the history of the Christian era. So don't be convinced by these lying wonders behind the pulpits of the churches today who focus your attention, all your cares, and all your concern for an unbelieving Israel on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. That is a diversion, the real target for Satan's hatred is those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, those who will inherit this earth 
when Christ takes over his kingdom. That stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands will strike the image in the feet, grind it to powder, and it'll blow away with the wind. All nations, all kings, all princes, all powers and potentates will be destroyed. There'll be but one kingdom in this world, and Christ will be the head of it, and we will be his beneficiaries. And that's what we look forward to. But in the meantime, Satan is aligning all of God's enemies against us because we hold tenaciously to the truth, to the Bible that convicts the whole world, even and especially that unbelieving Jerusalem at the end of the Mediterranean Sea. There are two Israels. One is visible and one is invisible. Back to you, Yerk. One is of the flesh, and one is of the spirit. And the spirit is what you have to believe in, and that's why there are many people who say, I cannot believe in what I don't see. You have a fine few examples of that, but we are not going into that right now. Rather, we continue. Who are his people? Well, of course, Tom explained that right now, but we are going to see what the author has to say. In the next three verses, Paul refers to ancient Israel's apostasy in the days of Elijah. God said to Elijah, when we read in verse 4 here, this is uh, still Galatians, if I'm not mistaken, but what sayest the answer of God unto him? I have, res I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal, or Baal. In Elijah's time, there were also two Israels. One followed Baal, while the other followed God. Then Paul made this application in verse 5, quote, Even so, then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And by the way, the election of grace, who is going to elect? God isn't he? And then he gives his grace. So can you become a Christian of free will? Think about that for some time. Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Just as in Elijah's time there was a faithful remnant of Israel, even so in Paul's time there was also a faithful remnant of believing Jews who, like himself, had been saved by grace. These are God's people. It is this faithful remnant of spiritual Israel whom God has certainly not cast away. Or just reading the essence of that sentence, the faithful remnant of spiritual Israel is not cast away. The others are cast away. Soon we will see this exact issue addressed in the book of Revelation. As in the days of Elijah, we are now in the midst of a terrible apostasy. Yet today God has his quote-unquote 7,000 who have not quote bowed the knee to Baal unquote. They are his faithful remnant, his Israel in the spirit. Like Elijah, they will be on the side of Jesus Christ and the truth at the Battle of Armageddon. And this finishes chapter 3, the shocking principle of two Israels, and we have choice and the chosen nation as chapter 4, in which we will go next. But you're, I, I, you're I have me. to... Yeah, yeah Tom, you, you, you get the mic in a second. Uh, okay. I have to postpone that because I didn't prepare the chapter because I didn't have time. So we will end our video today a little short in one hour. But Tom still has something to say to finish our video today and uh, making another important point to make sure that you very well understand and grasp what we were speaking about when it speaks about the two Israels. Please, Tom. Yes, I'd like to make a few very important comments about Paul. 
uh, my point was that the gospel at the end of the 70th week of Daniel was about to go to the Gentile world. Now, what Jew could ever comprehend or conceive that God would do such a thing? Forever, the Jews were God's chosen people, God's representative in the world. I mean, even Daniel prayed that God would, for his own namesake, forgive the Jews and restore them to their land and their temple so that they continue to work to, to, to be a witness to the world of the God of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was Daniel's great lamentation to the Lord. They found themselves in a Babylonian captivity. So who's going to witness to the world? And now here we have the end of the 70th week of Daniel. The Jews have once and for all rejected their Messiah. And God is going to do the unthinkable. He's going to present his salvation to the heathen world, to the Gentile world. Now, you have to understand the great sentiment of astonishment among the Jews that God would do such a thing. And how reluctant the Jews would be to accept such a thing. And what did God do? He chose a Pharisee, one who claimed to be the son of the sons of Abraham, accounting that to be their, their, their right to God's heavenly kingdom. We're the sons of Abraham, they said. Jesus said, no, you're a generation of vipers. You are of the flesh, but not of the spirit. And the ax is even prepared to lop you off at the ground when the judgment of Christ comes. And the most zealous of all of those Pharisees was Paul. Paul was the most devout Pharisee, the most Jewish Jew there was. And he made it his business to, to, to persecute to the point of murder all the Bible-believing Christians, all the Jews that accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Of, 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 of the persecutors of the church, Paul even admits with his own mouth, he was the chief. And the scripture bears witness to this, that when they were, when they were stoning Stephen, they laid their coats at Paul's feet. They acknowledged Paul's authority to persecute God's people. And not only was he the most unlikely of all the Pharisees to become a child of the prince that shall come, Jesus, Paul was also a Roman citizen. He was a citizen of a Gentile kingdom. We think this so unlikely that God would call someone like Paul to be his minister to the Gentiles. So what must a Jew think that the gospel is finally going to go to the Gentiles, just as unlikely as it was to choose Paul, the persecutor of the saints? God did the most unlikely thing of all. He chose Paul because he was going to do the unthinkable. He was going to give his good news to the Gentiles. Astonishing, isn't it, when you think of it in those terms? God was going to do the unthinkable. Make his covenant with the Gentiles. And he chose a Roman citizen and a Pharisee to do it. Now, is there anyone within the sound of my voice think that their sins have mounted up to heaven and God cannot forgive your sins? Is there one of you that have committed a heinous crime, a heinous sin against the God of gods, who think you're not worthy of the salvation of the blood of Christ? Then compare yourself with Paul, the persecutor of the saints, those who stoned Stephen to shut up the gospel. 
What greater crime, what greater criminal is there than Paul? And Paul acknowledges this, of sinners I am chief, the persecutor of the saints. On human terms, if Paul could have lived 10,000 years, he could never have atoned for the sins that he committed against the Most High. Just like a Gentile who had never even heard the gospel prior to Paul's teaching. So if you think you're one of those who have, have out, out, out sinned your day of grace, who have out sinned your day of grace, you have underestimated the power of the blood of Almighty God. If the salvation of Jesus Christ could come to the Gentiles by the hand of Paul of all people, then you too can be a beneficiary of Christ's precious blood and receive the atonement. You can be accounted righteous if you believe God when he said, I will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. Don't count yourself out because Christ said, I am the way. And he meant what he said. You believe it, and it will be accounted for you. It will be accounted to you for righteousness. Thanks, Yerk. That's all I have. the great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. So confident were that our founders and their idea about one generational responsibility one to the next, that they were confident that our country, that what they were putting forth would exist for the ages, for the ages. That was the challenge they gave us. That is the responsibility that we have. And for a couple of hundred years or more, that has always been the case. We're here today because we believe that, and we believe that the public policy that we put forth, the legislation we put forth should result in public policy that makes the future better. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. Now watch this drive. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful. And so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people. And neither do we. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue. To move forward for the American people. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. It's the third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. <laughs>